So, welcome again to everyone in the audience. Welcome also to everyone watching via live stream from around the world. We have the pleasure to welcome Christoph Engemann now. Christoph is an author, a teacher, and a researcher. He researches at the Institute for Advanced Studies on Media Culture of Computer Simulation. That is at the Leuphana University in Lüneburg. In his talk today, he will focus on the enabling dimensions of drone warfare. That's a little spin, by especially looking at data gathering and the mapping of social graphs. We will have a chance for a QA in the end, so please take notes. If you have questions in the end, you can ask them. We have plenty of time, but for now, with further ado, please help me welcome Christoph Engemann to his talk on graphs, drones, and phones, the role of social graphs for drones in the war on terror. Christoph Engemann. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a, it's a exciting to be back. Um, it's my third talk here, and as most of you know, I've re uh, pre uh, previously talked about history um, and present-day developments of identity media authentic uh, authentication technology. Um, my last talk I gave in a pretty hungover state, which um, you will see if you watch the video. <laughs> I slept better this night and had some coffee. I need more. Anyhow, what I'm going to do today um, is pretty much ask a very similar question than the questions I have asked before in this context here, is how do you identify people, but here in the context of drone warfare? Because whenever the talk or the debate came to drones and um, surveillance in the past decade, I always wondered how do they actually identify the individuals they see in the video feeds? Because that's an important part of, of the whole war on terror, discriminate individuals uh, and decide which ones you want to kill or capture um, and which ones not. And many may argue that drones kill quite indiscriminately, and that is um, definitely true, but at the same time, one can see, especially since um, the publication of the drone papers by The Intercept in October, that there's a fairly elaborate process, a bureaucratic and administrative process um, being put in place, at least in the American context. Um, a process that, that um, is meant to positively identify the individuals you're tracking and eventually taking out. Um, many, many people involved, many, many hours of, of um, surveillance. Um, there's this idea of um, an unblinking eye, of looking at people for weeks and weeks and weeks, and start the whole observation cycle anew once the eye blinks, once you lose visual tracking. But of course, this visual tracking somehow is suspicious. Um, first of all, the quality might not be uh, too good. Secondly, um, I couldn't fathom that they use biometric um, <coughs> technology in the context of this video feeds because uh, um, that would be too tall of an order. So there must have been something else. And that is what I'm trying Part of this puzzle, I think, um, I, I can offer some answers to. Um, there might be more that we don't know about. As with all of this research, it's difficult to do because there's little publicly available. Um, you have to puzzle together from the Snowden files, from, from other leaks, uh, and also from doctrinal papers or um, uh, like BA, MA, and PhD works that people in the military do, which is an interesting resource if you start to look at those. Um, you will find tons and tons of interesting uh, papers tackling exactly these problems. So one little clue came in 2008 or 2009 in this Wired article about tagging technology that's used in the war on terror. Basically, it's kind of RFID or um, um, RFID tags or uh, technologies that's, that work in some way in the optical spectrum by uh, tagging people with paint or any kind of other th um, medium that then will show up in certain spectra. Oh, the cat is gone. <laughs> That's a pity. Um, but that, again, seems to be 
fairly difficult to do because you need access to the individuals or parts, you know, things they own, equipment they have in order to do that. And also the question is how discriminate can, can this get? So um, there must be, some, as I said, something else. And uh, in order to further my argument that I want to make today, uh, which to outline it once more, focus less on the drones than on the infrastructure, I have to take you on a little detour through history, more precisely the history of graph theory. And those of you who are trained in computer science or maybe some sociologist probably know way more than I do about graph theory and I'm happy to learn from you in the Q&A or afterwards. The foundations of graph theory, this is Pregel and this is the river Pregel, um, we are laid in the 18th century by the Swiss mathematician Leonhard Euler, and he was employed at the Academy uh, of Sciences in St. Petersburg, uh, which had posed um, the so-called Königsberger Brücken problem. Um, and the question was, can one cross the seven bridges of Königsberg, crossing the uh, river Pregel here, and never cross the same bridge twice? And Euler's solution was basically to abstract this geographical ensemble into a set of points and their connections, which can be depicted like this or depicted like that. And um, both graphs, these are graphs, are isomorphic, they are the same. Even though they look different, they show the same relationship, the same topology. <coughs> Okay, and uh, what we are seeing is four points called vertices or knots um, in graph balance, as well as seven connections, um, which represent the bridges in this problem, um, which are called edges. So the knots or vertices are the land masses, and uh, the edges uh, are the bridges. And Euler could show that all four land masses in Königsberg would have, uh, have an uneven number of bridges, and that in such a setup, it is impossible to find a way that crosses the bridges only once. And graphs are typically notated like this. A graph is a vertice and an edge. And um, as, I, as I said, um, the number of edges between two vertices um, are usually called weights. And the more edges you have, the more weights you have uh, in a given graph. And despite this graphical representation I just showed here, uh, it is important to remember that this is less a visual tool. It is also a visual tool, but less so. But form, uh, foremost, a mathematical description uh, where you can do calculations on. And graphs have found applications in a wide range of fields, from chemistry, where the relations between atoms and molecules can be represented uh, as such, in linguistics or in neuroscience, where the connections between neurons are described via graphs. And some of you might have seen this presentation. It's actually by the NSA. Um, they have uh, two slide sets publicly available. They have um, a nice little journal uh, for public consumption on their website. And in the 2014 um, volume on big data, they basically explain their interest in graphs. Um, and this, uh, this slide is taken from there. So this is what uh, in neuroscience parlance you would call a connectome. It's the individual graph of the connections between the synapses of a given brain, which is a pretty big data problem, as you can see. Um, and last not least, uh, of course, you have graphs in computer science, where they provide one of the most important data structures used for file systems. It's the Linux file system, which is a tree, which is a special form of graphs for dependency matrix, control, control for representations, compilers, and so forth. But <clears throat> there's another important branch of science where graph theory has made an impact, and which moreover is important to the war on terror discussion and the argument I want to make here. And this is sociology, and um, let me just give you a very short insight uh, about the weird uh, way this, this debate has taken uh, in sociology. Um, so they didn't enter sociology straightforward. As usual with new paradigms, they came basically from the sidelines. In this case, in the guise of Jacob Moreno, a flamboyant figure most widely known for the innovation of psychodrama. 
um, which is a sort of improvised theater. We had a workshop on that or a talk on that uh, at a conference here. Um, and who also was an avid social reformer, engaged with convicts, with orphans, uh, single mothers, and so forth in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s of the last century. And alongside using psychodrama to educate and empower his clients, Moreno also developed a technique which he, which he called psychological geography or sociometry. And basically, Moreno depicted individuals as points and their relations as arrow lines. And here you can see a, um, one of his psychological geographies from his book, um, Who Shall Survive, in, uh, written in 1934. And that's a school class in their first year. The boys are on the left and the girls are on the right. And um, as you can see, there's quite a lot of connections going back and forth between the individuals um, in this class and between the genders. And basically, Moreno mapped out these connections using um, um, you know, questioning the people, who you, do you talk to, how often, how often do you spend time with such and such, uh, and so forth. And after two years, um, the same psychological geography looks like this. Boys and girls are basically strictly separated, except for two uh, individuals which basically cross the gender line here. Right? <clears throat> and this already pretty much looks like a graph um, by Euler, but it needed a couple of trained mathematicians to make that connection. And cutting a longer story short, if you want to read up on this, there's a, a, a nice book uh, available for free online by Linton Friedman on uh, social network theory, where you can find basically the history of these developments. Um, so this mathematician was Axel Bervelas, um, who worked in, together with Kurt Levine, another famous um, um, psychologist of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, at the MIT in the Research Center for Group Dynamics. And together with two PhD students, Richard Lace and Albert Perry, they provided the first formal um, definition or proof um, of such what we now would call social graphs. Um, and moreover, um, invented more or less a class of measures which we now call centrality measures, where you can uh, mathematically um, measure uh, the degree of connectedness and uh, the importance of a given uh, vertice in a graph. So the context they did this research in was basically um, uh, companies um, which had an interest in knowing the difference between the formal and informal hierarchies within their institutions. So this is at the height of Fordism, of Tayloristic um, uh, work organization methods where you have very, very strict hierarchies, the boss on the top and the worker uh, on the lowest level and many middle managers in there. And what the research showed is that despite this formal organization, you have very important informal networks. And early social network research was concerned um, with, with the relation between those two networks and with finding out who is actually central in the information flow uh, in these organizations. Another um, important field of research in this context was uh, pharmaceutical companies who wanted to know how to push um, uh, 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 their, uh, their medications into the market and for this, they needed to know which doctors influence opinion. So they mapped out basically the informal networks between doctors in order to find out which doctors do you need to give basically or do you need to uh, target for your advertisement. This is in the 50s and 60s. And this is the context where centrality measures first developed. They then move over into bibliometric research, uh, basically finding out which academic sites whom uh, which is another example for more or less informal networks. So, um, let me skip a little bit here. Okay, so far for the historical outline, um, which served to highlight the context of the emergence of centrality measures from organizational psychology and sociology. Um, it is the study of oral and written communication that is important. Uh, in groups where these centrality measures emerged 
and where centrality became the index for the stability or instability of an organization. And the tools of means are what we today call social networks, um, so many mathematical <laughs> ideas on concepts emerged um, in these discourses and thus way before computers came into the pictures. So jumping forward to today, or basically, let's, let's take that back, jumping forward to 2000, so 15 years back, uh, we have seen uh, the rise of a graph industrial complex. First of all, of course, Google proved that graphs and graph centrality measures and PageRank is basically a graph centrality measure that came out of Leo Katz's centrality measure um, idea in the, which he invented in the early 50s, also in the context I just described. So Google proved that um, that these measures are instrumental in managing the seemingly unmanageable dynamics of the internet and showed um, that you could, gr could graph out uh, billions of web websites and their vertices as backlink and, the back and the backlinks as edges um, and that you can provide a tool for navigate navigation in this context. And since 2005, we have seen a number of new actors that emerged um, which managed not only to capture the relations of websites, but of individuals and their actions and graphs. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Friendster, Instagram, Tumblr, and so forth all rely on graphing out their respective populations. And in 2012, the consultancy Gartner offered the following uh, take on this development. Um, they basically say there are five essential strategic graphs in today's economy. Um, this is the paper, which is uh, paid content. If somebody can provide me with the full paper, I'd be thankful. I only have parts of it. And so this is, this is from, uh, from this report. So the five uh, uh, strategic graphs, the social graph, intent graph, consumption graph, interest graph, and mobile graph, um, search um, would, you know, is probably intent or interest. That's a little bit unclear, right? But that's basically what Google owns. Um, the uh, consumption graph more or less is owned currently by Amazon. Um, the mobile graph is split across a couple of telcos. Um, and the social graph, of course, is more or less owned by Facebook uh, and Twitter, at least in the context of, of um, Western industrialized nations. So now, if you, now most of you will probably make the connection. Is it just the economy that understood the important or the strategic re relevance of graphs? And certainly not. So after the Snowden revelations, um, the German Bundestag, uh, so the parliament, implemented an investigative committee to study the, ex the extent of NSA and 5 i surveillance um, uh, especially in Germany. And part of the proceedings was the invitation of the NSA whistleblower, uh, William Binney, who also has been uh, here at uh, the Chaos Communication Congress, I think, two years ago. And asked by the German members of parliament what they actually did at the NSA, Binney answered the following. Um, we built a relationship in what we call a graph, a social network of the world. So. Um, the transcripts of, of, of this sitting of the committee are available via WikiLeaks. It's a 187-page uh, paper, and it's really interesting to read, because Binney basically explains um, back and forth how they graphed out the world and how important that was. Um, he mentions graphs and social graphs, I think, 15 times or 16 times. He never once gets asked, actually, by any member of the committee what that actually is. They either know and have a quite good understanding of this concept, or they just ignore it. What they're interested in, if you read this paper, it's, uh, it's interesting to see. Um, they ask a lot of questions about career pathways with, within the NSA on the one hand. So how do you become somebody you know, like him, a technical director at the NSA? How much money he makes? <laughs> um, he says 20% less than a US senator, that's the highest pay grade in the NSA. Um, and then, of course, they're very interested in how far um, Germany was targeted in this context. And the other interesting tidy bit is that the NSA 
uh, at least he says, uh, gave the uh, Bundesnachrichtendienst, the German equivalent, the source code to this um, project uh, in the uh, early 2000s. So Binet's uh, project was called uh, ThinThread, which basically, we don't know exactly what it is, but basically seems to be um, a huge graph database. And um, the difference to what came later and why uh, Binney became an NSA uh, whistleblower um, was that it basically did two things. First of all, it wasn't a full take approach like the NSA and Five Eyes do now, so they didn't take the, all of the internet traffic. And secondly, it would encrypt the data of individuals with US citizenship, right? Um, if one is to believe Drake and Binney, Thomas Drake's the other, um, whistleblower, um, the successor to ThinThread was a project called Trailblazer, which was implemented by private contractors and basically did away uh, with these two restrictions that, that ThinThread had. So that's, that's their basic problem, right? I mean, um, it's, uh, it's astonishing. Um, how strongly they oppose uh, basically Trailblazer, whereas ThinThread already, if you think about it, was basically graphing out the world, and that's what he says. So there's another interesting element in here, and this is the timing of this. Binney mentions in the NSA Untersuchungsausschuss um, report that they started in the early 90s with this project and had a working prototype in the second half of the 90s. So to anyone familiar with the um, infrastructural necessities of graph processing and the developments in the commercial field in the past decade, so what you know, these companies I just showed from the Gartner report basically did. So key value stores, MapReduce, and other means of distributed computing, um, you will agree that it's quite astonishing that they're already in the second half of the 90s were basically able to do this. <coughs> So the important part here is that it's not only businesses but also governments that have understood the value of graphs and acquired the means uh, of generating and exploiting them. And I believe what has happened in the past 15 years, basically between 2000 and today, is an ongoing race to graph the world. And not only a graph industrial complex but a military academic graph indu industrial complex has basically emerged. Um, on the commercial side, we have what Bruce Sterling calls the stacks. I just talked about them, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so forth. Um, and if you look beyond, basically, the Western world, um, you will see that China has Qzone, Tencent, Renren, Baidu, Sina, Weibo, and the Russians have VK Kontakte, and Momia as Facebook equivalents. And basically, these are all, invita all invitations for you to become graft, right? In VK Kontakte, you get MP3s for free, and um, they're happy to have you as a node in their system. Um, on the government side, we have the NSA and 5i which are in the business of graphing the world. And the papers from the Snowden archives, if you look at them so far, uh, only provide indirect um, material because they concentrate more on the means of um, access and collection of data. So PRISM, Bullrun, Fairview, and all these uh, acronyms basically describe how to get the data. And we know relatively little, at, at least on the basis of those papers, on the aggregation and analytical tools William Binney, to come back to him, last year um, in 2014 explained ThinThread and the Snowden files to a select audience at a dinner in Washington and pointed out that StellarWind, Mainway and Marina are the graphing tools used um, for discovery and development of targets by the NSA. And um, this again are uh, slides which you will find on the net. It's really interesting to read that through because it's basically a Q&A where uh, Binney explains um, how this is supposed to work. Um, we don't really know if, if he actually tells the truth, but uh, what he says is basically you, have a, you graph uh, uh, as much as you can and then you use centrality measures in order to um, create what he calls zones of suspect. It's uh, um, in the uh, green uh, bubble here. Uh, and these individuals are the ones which you follow up further on and profile out. So, but what do you do once you have something like the zone of suspects, uh, a graph of a terror network, if you want to 
uh, call it that. And this is a question of much debate in both doctrinal, doc doctrinal literature as well in the academic research I uh, mentioned in the beginning, so the military academic research, um, around so-called dark networks. So this would be a dark network in the, in the bubble here, uh, the, the bad guys. And a striking example of the thinking, so there's, there's tons of papers I just pulled out too to show you a little bit um, how they conceptualize that. Um, a striking example is the U.S. Counterinsurgency Field Manual, published in 2006, too much public fanfare. I don't know how many Americans are here. Maybe you remember, because even the New York Times reported about this. The U.S. military, I mean, this is in the depth of, of Iraq and Afghanistan wars. They had no counterinsurgency uh, insurgency doctrine. The last doctrine was, was written in the 70s in the context of the Vietnam War. And then after, you know, the way that war went, nobody wanted to do coin, as they call it, counterinsurgency. Um, but um, three or four years into these wars, they figured out we probably need a doctrine. So um, they had this guy write one, David Petraeus, um, who later became the CIA director until um, uh, he was basically removed from that position in 2012. This is another interesting book which you really should read, um, even though it's an oilogy and, you know, Fred Kaplan is not a good author, but it's, if only, if only, well, yeah, you know, he's one of those military um, experts, but if only half of the stories um, about the Iraq war, uh, he tells are true. It's pretty amazing what happened uh, in the political um, system in the U.S. in that time. Anyhow, so Petraeus writes this, this counterinsurgency manual, and of course there's an appendix of so on social network analysis and exploitation in there, which is really, really short, just a couple of pictures. And here's an example uh, how they envision this. <coughs> so, Basically, what you see is a graph of uh, some kind of insurgent uh, terrorist or whatever you uh, call it, subgroup, which they map out. <coughs> and now the important doctrinal um, uh, notion is shaping, right? So what you want to do in a counterinsurgency or war on terror context is shaping the graph of, your th of the enemy. So you have uh, the network uh, on the left side and you implement some measure like cordon and search then you grab out a couple of people, start few, uh, food distribution, and during this time, basically map out the uh, communications, uh, graph out uh, the insurgents. And the idea is to shape the graph in a way that it reveals information about who is important in this context. You can use, of course, the centrality measures I um, mentioned in the beginning, so again, this is shaping. And there is much debate about how to do this, actually. And uh, another interesting example for what I just described uh, is this paper that came out of West Point, the uh, uh, Network Science Center there, uh, shaping op operations to attack robust uh, terror networks. And they use a publicly available data set, the so-called Tanzania data set, which is a graph of Al-Qaeda 1998 in the context of the bombing of the US Embassy. And um, what they offer is basically an algorithm that promises to automate the decisions uh, which nodes to attack in order to shape your graph. And the idea is to render the graph more uh, fragile um, by generating more centrality, by making it less distributed and more central. So basically the algorithm tells you which nodes do you need to attack in order to have a star-shaped network in the end, and then know who is actually the most important person in here. Because, I mean, the quality is bad here and it's really tiny in the paper. But basically in A, they don't know who, who Bin Laden is. And they want to know who that is, and this algorithm basically offers attack this node, this node, and this node, and eventually um, the communications will lead to Bin Laden, which is actually this uh, individual down here. So they call this fragility, which is basically the inver you know, not really the inversion, but um, tied to centrality, and um, which seeks to find a set of nodes whose removal would maximize the network's wide centrality. And we also include the problem of no strike list, so basically, the algorithm will take those people out, which you which are not supposed to attack. Um, 
And this is because real-world targeting of terrorism and insurgent networks of, uh, often includes restrictions against certain individuals and so forth. And they also prove, even prove that this is an uh, NP-complete NP problem. <laughs> so read this paper, it's really interesting, and there's many, many more. I think this is one of the more important ones. So this is basically an algorithm that helps decision-making in, in shaping graphs, right? So, um, but how do you actually get those graphs when people are not online all the time like we are and have those little uh, cell phones in them and are on Facebook and so forth? And that was the problem basically that you had uh, in a country like Afghanistan and what the US military did what basically, uh, was basically to hire anthropologists. Uh, and they sent the anthropologists in the field and asked people those questions here. Uh, what are, so the, the you know, people in the villages and so forth. Um, what five people here have you known the longest, etc. And you enter that in a tool like this, um, where you basically generate a graph um, of the given population uh, in your area and uh, hence can shape it. This is the map uh, HT, map human terrain. They called, called this the human terrain system, which was closed down a year ago. Um, it ran from 2006 to 2014, very controversial. The American Anthropological Association actually came out to oppose uh, the system uh, and um, uh, protested strongly against it. There is an interesting movie about it, which I re recommend to watch. It's actually not clear, if, uh, um, I, I'm not sure if they actually used the software. Uh, this is just taken. Um, from a handbook of the map uh, human terrain um, system. Um, but what they definitely used and what you will find in, in many, many papers is IBM's Analyst Notebook, which is basically uh, a software tool which offers you to map all social graphs and give you get the centrality measures um, and can use that in order to track and profile individuals. And of course, what they use is uh, Palantir, which I think owns the market for, for graphing technologies in, in this context. Um, uh, anybody here who actually has worked on a Palantir workstation? I'm still waiting to find somebody. Um, I strongly encourage you to watch the YouTube, present, uh, the YouTube video on counterterrorism uh, that Palantir has up. It's really interesting. So Palantir is basically a Peter Thiel founded star uh, a backed uh, startup founded in 2006, uh, which has seen a meteoric rise and um, which started out as, uh, with a software product allowing graphic, uh, graphing uh, for government entities and now has branched out in all kinds of fields. Um, mostly fraud detection in banks, but they also do philanthropic engineering. So if you want to map out your um, clients as a philanthrop philanthropist, Palantir has a solution for you. Okay, so this is the analytical level. Um, but of course, you know, what about the drones? And um, what I think we have to think about uh, drones as is um, less tools of visual collection but more tools of collection of communication metadata, basically cell phone data. And if you uh, look in all those presentations which float around on the web, um, you will stumble upon all those pots that the drones carry. Of course, they always have a camera and they have a visual uh, tracking tool on board, but they also have the communications and networking. This is the Argus pod, which is a wide area um, surveillance system. They have the communications and networkings part which basically siphons in all the uh, communication data in a given area. And that data uh, gets aggregated uh, and uh, graphed out. So I think we have to think about drones as crawlers, just as the Google bot is a crawler that indexes web pages and their links. Uh, what drones basically do is they crawl an area and index all the communication that is going on, allowing you to build up uh, a graph of that. Um, of course, there's also the other side. They not only collect, they also target um, uh, nodes uh, of the graphs they have created. And this is another strand of the doctrinal uh, debate that has been going on in the past 10 years, because the initial armament of drones were the Hellfire missiles, which were anti-tank missiles developed in the 80s, which have quite a strong warhead, where you have the problem uh, of collateral damage. 
And uh, what has basically happened since 2005 is a race to find um, ammunition which allow you to target individuals. So that's called discrete effects, right? Uh, this is, um, so <coughs> personal targets, the frag belt is personal targets plus less than lethal mode. So you, I don't know what less than lethal means if, you, if something like that hits you. Um, and they, I mean, this is just one example. There are many m competing systems. Um, this, this, call, this is called Viper Strike. And they all come with these nice little uh, um, circles which tell you the blast areas of different ammunitions. And basically, as you can see, it's, it's relatively small compared to, uh, to a Hellfire missile or other uh, ammunitions. So this is basically what shaping can be. There are two ways to shape a graph. Uh, kinetic and non-kinetic. Non-kinetic would be the food distribution shown in the counterinsurgency manual uh, or the snatch and grab. And kinetic shaping is basically the euphemism for killing people with tools like that. And I think what we have seen, if you think about it in a doctrinal context and also in the history of aerial warfare, is that we have a shift from weapons of mass destruction to weapons of individual destruction. This is basically, they went into Iraq to find weapons of mass destruction. They came out of it with weapons of individual destruction. This is, I think, what, what has happened, right? So to come to an end, <laughs> thank you. I think, and you know, this is ongoing research. I'm basically presenting you my toolbox and the ideas I'm developing right now, and this, of course, needs to be fleshed out. But what has happened uh, since 2000, maybe a little bit earlier, um, which at least w is what Binny's, um, what Binny would indicate, what Binny said would indicate, is that graphs have emerged as strategic or geostrategic assets, and that there is a race by governmental but also business entities to basically to graph out the world. Who owns the biggest graph? It's important, right? Facebook has 1.2 or 1.4 billion people graphed out, right? Also, there is this problem that they blur the distinction between maps and territory, because a graph is not just a map. Right? It's not just a visual representation, it's actually a dynamic representation of the activity, uh, of the communication, of the relations of the individuals, um, which you, of course, already sh shape in the moment you observe it, but which provides a different level of actionable intelligence than a map would do. Right? And last but not least, it's really difficult to obfuscate graphs. It's really difficult to get away from them. You can encrypt your communication, but you s still would be visible as nodes who communicate. And what Binny and other people, also Snowden, always highlight, and that's basically the metadata aspect, that, uh, aspect that's, that's what graphs do. They ingest metadata and give you an idea who is connected to whom uh, in, in, um, in what form of relatedness, how close, how far, and so forth. Um, so basically, it's very difficult to, to get, um, to stay out of graphs or um, to use, uh, to develop tools which will actually um, uh, create, create false leads or any kind of other uh, uh, wrong impressions of you in a graph. So to wrap this up, I think we need to think about um, who owns graphs and what does it mean for us and how can we deal with that. Thank you. We have 20 minutes for questions. So if you have questions, please go to one of the four microphones in the aisles. We're going to start with a question from the internet while everyone else is getting ready for the microphones. Okay. The internet, please. We got only one question here. Could you tell us the name of the YouTube mu movie about human terrain graphics uh, software? Okay, um, so one is the Palantir um, demo on counterinsurgency. Uh, and um, I actually forgot the name of the Human Terrain movie. Just Google Human Terrain and movie, you'll find it. It's on IMDb. I don't know if the whole movie is available on YouTube. Thank you. Okay, then um, in the front on the, what is that? Left side. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. And I have a question regarding um, the um, 
uh, the um, creation of the graphs. Because if you, if you create those kind of graphs, you certainly have some kind of measurement error because it's very hard to, to, uh, to create these graphs. Mm -hmm. And um, most intralid measures are very sensitive to those kind of measurement errors. So mm -hmm. my question is, um, do you know about any kind of research, research that has a uh, focus on the question um, how noisy these graphs are and mm -hmm. what kind of implications are there? Because if you make some kind of kill decision based on those graphs, maybe you, you kill the wrong guy. Yeah, yeah. Or mostly you kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not familiar with that with with the academic literature on that, but um, that's that's actually questions that, for example, Binny gets asked mm -hmm. and doesn't really answer. Right? If you look in the NSA Untersuchungsausschuss, um, he he uh, remains fairly unclear uh, in that context. If you look at, for example, the MIT Network Research Center, you will find papers that address that question. Because um, one of the things you will see also in the, in the drone papers by The Intercept is that basically they try to either automize um, the decision making so uh, the responsibility can be delegated to a machine or else put it as, on as many shoulders as possible. Right? So there is a review pr process of a review process of a review process involved in those decision making uh, decision makings on, on, on whom to target. And that's how I think they try to deal with that. But the technical side, of course, um, is uh, probably really complicated. I'm not a uh, technical expert on, on, on these questions. Thank you so much. OK, then question over here. Right Thank side. you very much. I just wanted to make sure that I got the shaping thing yeah. right. Because does that mean that people are arrested or even killed yeah. just because there happen to be yeah. a node in a graph yeah. that makes the graph more central when it's removed? Not because they did something bad or are suspected terrorists, but just because of the information you can mm -hmm. gain from removing that person from the graph? Is that what shaping essentially means? Yes. Well. That's so. I don't know, and it's probably um, without uh, security clearance impossible to get the information if greedy fragile, which is the algorithm I showed there, is actually u deployed somewhere, right? But the doctrinal papers all basically say you have to identify uh, persons, you know, with, w that have a certain influence within the network, as depicted by certain centrality measures and either take them to extract information from them or take them in order to see what happens in the graph. But that's, that's exactly what they're doing. That is what shaping does. OK, thank you. Then we have a question on this side, on the microphone in the front. Good to have you there. Uh, two questions for you. First of all, thanks for presenting this talk. Um, from an American's perspective, it's pretty fascinating to see how this is ingested in a European context. Um, first of all, did you look at the technologies used on, mounted on UAVs to pull selectors off the ground? Um, and have you looked at the application of biometrics onto, mm -hmm. these, um, onto these technologies? And then the second question, that's all one question. <laughs> The second question is about um, prediction. Uh, Palantir and other mm -hmm. technologies develop, other um, similar platforms have predictive elements that are built into their algorithms. Um, have you looked at how those are used to target individuals <coughs> within no. those networks for extraction or whatever? I didn't get the part of the UA uh, on the UAVs. Did you study the technologies used to pull selectors off the ground, DRT boxes, no. No. so forth? No. I didn't. So I didn't really look into the technical details. So to give you, to, so in order to give you an idea, who you know what I do basically, I'm interested in the media change of statehood. So how we move from a from a state that was basically built on on paper administrations to digital administrations, and how new tools come into the picture and shape or, or um, um, change uh, how a nation state for example, deals with something like individual identity with borders or the notion of a territory. So I'm looking at that level, and I'm not an expert on the, on the uh, uh, technical um, you know, details here, um, but uh, look into the Snowden uh, uh, files. There's, there's a couple of catalogs that will give you some information on the tools that they uh, use to acquire the data and um, you know, capture phone signals and so forth. I don't know anything about biometrics in the context of uh, UAVs. I, I don't think they're deployed there uh, to a wide extent because uh, biometrical 
um, technologies just happen to have too high false positive or false negative identification rates. And I think what they still do is basically have individuals sit there uh, and use um, humans um, as um, uh, tools for identification. Right? Okay, then we go back over here to this microphone, please. Hi, I'm Henrik. Uh, I'm a reporter. I've written a number of stories based on uh, classified documents, uh, this mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and I can understand your frustration in not having access to mm -hmm. a lot of this material. Um, I was wondering, can you talk a little bit more about classified research and, and which, which trade-offs you as a researcher see in going into that work? There's stuff mm -hmm. going on at Heilbronn in the UK between the GCHQ and an, a university. There's West Point in the US. But this is stuff that you, as someone publicly facing, yeah. cannot access. Um, right. That's the first question. The second one is the relationship between the graph um, work done in the commercial world and what your impression is of what's going on in the yeah. secret world. Yeah. The strength ratio is, is one much further than the other one, oh, okay. et cetera. Mm. Thanks. Well, um, as for the classified research, I mean, that's basically something uh, that I have to accept that I, you know, work on the basis of leaks and um, publications by academics uh, in the military context. Um, and one way to, to deal with that is uh, to basically stay in the historical realm. So, you know, look back in time and try to puzzle, puzzle out what happened in the 80s and 90s. You can't talk much about present day developments because you just don't know. You can, you know, make educated guess, guesses as best. As for the relation between business and government, uh, graphing, uh, I don't know what I think and what is fairly evident if you, uh, if you look at the documents um, on also academic uh, debates in the first part of, of, of um, uh, 2000, um, you will find there's a lot of going back and forth. Right? I think that's just, you know, it's, it's not a conspiracy or anything, it's just a discussion, a discourse that emerged where people from academia talk to people from the military, talk to people in uh, uh, um, in the NSA and other um, uh, secret services, um, and uh, where this, these ideas basically were floating around, and some people made a business out of it, uh, facing consumers, others made a business out of it, facing the government, and others made a business out of it, you know, uh, uh, facing um, not consumers but um, uh, businesses, right? So I think that's, that's, that's for sure. I'm not, I have no idea how good or bad uh, the graphing, graphing capabilities of uh, GHQ uh, or um, NSA is, uh, but it's pretty certain that they use Palantir, for example, and that Palantir is something like a software package that you can deploy fairly quickly and does what you need. So there is, uh, um, the commercial sector seems to be pretty strong uh, in this. And over here on the microphone to the left. Um, hello, uh, thank you for your talk. I've got one more of a remark than a question. Mm -hmm. um, you were questioning whether biometric um, identification actually might be useful. Yeah. Um, I've got one idea what actually I fear might work, um, and that is um, movement pattern mm -hmm. uh, detection because there definitely is a lot of research also in the public about it and it even works on basis of people that only are mm -hmm. like five pixels tall. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what, what you will find is um, talk about pattern of life uh, exploitation and uh, pattern of life is basically mapping out who you relate to, but also where you s where you spend uh, um, time during your day and during night. So, wh what is your bed down place, right? Uh, where do you eat and so forth? And uh, part of this uh, targeting process, identification uh, process, is basically developing a pattern of life signature for an individual, and that, of course, um, is also used for prediction. For example, where will this individual be tomorrow um, at noontime and so forth. That definitely is part of this process. Um, other biometrical means like gate detection um, or facial recognition and so forth, 
uh, I don't think will be used in drone context. If you, if you, there's another field is IED, um, counter IED, also imp uh, improvised uh, explosive devices. They use quite a lot of biometrics there, but that's fingerprinting, retina printing on the ground, uh, scanning on the ground. Yeah, I definitely agree that those things will not be available for drones, but yeah. I mean, my, my fear is that things like your walking pattern are just yeah. things that you probably have no chance of escaping. True, yeah. Thank you. Um, quick question in between. Has the internet any <laughs> questions? The internet is silent. Oh. 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 OK, then we go back over here to the side, please. Okay. Please speak directly into the microphone. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I have like two quick observations on this. One of them is that there's actually kind of apparently a little um, open source ecosystem forming. So a few yeah. years back, NSA kind of open sourced um, one oh, of cool. their databases, Accumulo, mm -hmm. and that's been picked up by a lot of academia. They've yeah. rebranded it, I think, D4M, but mm -hmm. they're kind of using the NSA code quite happily. And then um, a few weeks back, GCHQ kind of layered on top with their own open source database thing. And it's kind of interesting to see that they're actually open sourcing this stuff. The other thing is kind of, I, I wonder whether you've seen this, this as well. I think there's a thing about most big data, and it seems to apply to these national security things as well, where you talk about it quite a lot, but then in the end, you come down, and come down in like day-to-day -day business to very simplistic yeah. things, right? So you talk about all these graph and behavioral patterns things, and then if you look at the actual documentation for something like X key score, it turns out it's basically a version of grep, right? So it's basically mm -hmm. like very, very simplistic matching, and I wonder whether, mm -hmm. how much of the kind of, have you seen any indica indications of how much of this is actually kind of, um, uh, yeah, head in the, in the clouds kind of thinking that then in, in practice looks completely different? Mm. Um, to that question, I, you know, I don't know because there you can't really look inside uh, these projects. Um, uh, but my guess would be it's fairly simple. It's just the scale, right, which is not simple. It's, the, it's uh, accessing lots of lots of data points. Uh, ingesting the data and being able to uh, to store it indefinitely and search it. Um, Benjamin Bratton, who comes out with a book called uh, The Black Stack, uh, calls this the big haul. So basically, in the past decade, they could haul in all the data of the world, and um, that you know provides, of course, a strategic resource, uh, which other uh, entities might not have access to. As for Accumulo, um, yeah, I found it interesting too. Um, I think basically, I mean, if you look at Hacker News and all those websites, you will find a lot of debates about, um, the, you know, uh, the software infrastructure of the stacks of the of the big five companies: Apple, Amazon, um, Microsoft, Facebook, um, and I wouldn't wonder if they basically if there's a lot, you know, of knowledge and also tools going back and forth. You know, it's, base, it's, it's probably, look, if you would have a chart, you know, that shows you how um, the stack looks in the NSA, it probably doesn't look much different from Amazon. Yeah. And maybe Amazon even runs parts of it. So. And that's what I mean by military, academic, industrial complex, right? There's just knowledge floating around, there's know-how uh, that is available and that can be employed, you know, academically, it can be employed in the business context, can be employed in this context. It's just a discourse that, that emerged uh, once so much data was around and, and the necessity to graph that out uh, turned out to be valuable. Right. Okay, thank you. And then we have one more question on the left side, please. Um, you told us about shaping of social mm -hmm. graphs the military does. Um, is removal of nodes the only operation no. that is done there, or no. is there also research on inserting nodes, on taking yeah. over nodes? Um, well, food distribution is not removing nodes. It's giving nodes something and uh, an opportunity to see where the food ends up, who talks to whom, what do the people tell you um, when, uh, when you give them food. And I mean, basically, targeted ads is shaping, right? I mean, if, if Facebook uh, hands you out some, something on your timeline, you click on it, it has successfully shaped the graph, right? So, um, that, you know, in a, doctor, in a military doctrinal context, of course, uh, there, is a, there is an option available that, that includes removing nodes, but the knowledge um, uh, goes far beyond that. Right, the, 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 the possibilities uh, than just removing a node. 
Okay, we have a question on this side, on the right side, please. Hi, um, it's not really a question, just uh, some thoughts regarding the previous question. Um, so Accumulo is actually a fork of HBase, yeah. which is an open source project. I totally agree that it is to some degree different, but in the end, the core is the same technology. Okay. Um, and also recently, I noticed that GCHQ has released an, um, an open source um, graph a tool, let's uh -huh. say, distributed graph tool. So What's the name of it? I have it on my cell phone, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, but what, what, what I wanted to say is that the industry actually has tools that are really similar, or mm -hmm. at least we can think so, to what also the other people are using. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Then please go to the microphone now. Internet is silent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you.